All right, welcome. Just a couple quick reminders about the exam coming up next Tuesday. Um, it will be based, as we've said multiple times, on the Positive Physics Unit 12 assessment. You'll be completing the Unit 12 assessment in the Positive Physics website. You may use your notes, you may use your textbook. I would ask you to not use any online resources, just unless it's your online textbook uh, or you've taken notes on online, but no other online searching. And obviously you shouldn't get help from any person, uh, but you may use your notes, you may use your textbook. You obviously may use a calculator. You may use the AP formula list. And I've talked a bunch about using the AP Classroom website and the Positive Physics websites to review. So when you come on Tuesday the 15th, next Tuesday at 8.30 a.m., I'll give you a couple quick reminders like I just did. Then you will have from 8.30 a.m. until 11.30 a.m. to do the 30 questions on Positive Physics website. You'll check answers for all 30. When you're done with all 30, you'll click finalize. Then you'll go back through and correct anything you miss. And you need to get it all done within that three hour window. So from 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. after that window, time is up, no more corrections. Everything has to be wrapped up within that window. I don't think it will take you that long. I've planned it to be an hour and a half test, but that was before I realized we had three hours, uh, but I don't regret it. I, I'm glad with the length of the test. You have the three hours to do both all 30 questions completed and the corrections. Um, no extra time will be allowed outside. You have to get it done in that three hours. Um, your grade will be the average of your original percentage before corrections and the percentage after corrections. And that average will be your exam score. So that is what you can expect. Um, now, today, we're going to just continue to review with a variety of kind of problems. So I'm going to put you in breakout groups and have you solve this problem. You'll see we've got a four kilogram steel box being pulled with 20 newtons of force. It is at the instant we're looking at it moving at eight meters per second. So it is kinetic friction, not static. You can see underneath it says the coefficient of friction for copper and steel is 0.36. And it's asking you to figure out the, the acceleration of the block with this 20 newton pulling force. So I'll put you into groups give you about five or six minutes to see if you can come up with a result. And uh, then we'll check it out together when you come back from the group time. All right, make sure you write down these numbers. If you're watching on the video, just pause for a minute, see if you can solve it, and then come back and watch the groups give the answer. All right, I believe everybody is back in the main room now. Um, group one, were you guys able to come up with an answer for this? Did you have a time to finish? So we got Andy, Jack, and Kayla. Um, we didn't quite finish it. Okay, uh, how did you start? Um, I started by um, finding the net force by doing, or finding the force of the friction by doing the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Okay. And then were you going to use that to find net force or is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Group two, did, did you have a chance to get finished or were you still working? That's Kyle, Nat, and Sally. Um, I finished and I, I got John into my answer. Okay, so yeah, you're group four. So yeah. Kate, Evan, and Rocky, that's fine. Go ahead. Did you get an answer? Oh, my bad. Uh, I got 1.46 or 47. Okay, all right. And that's your acceleration meters per second squared. Did you have a chance as a group to discuss it or did you not really have a chance to talk it through? Not yet. Okay, I might've cut a little bit too short then. Maybe need to give a few more minutes to the next class. Uh, how about group three, or sorry, back to group two, Kyle, Nat, and Sally. I saw some head motion, but I didn't hear from, uh, did you guys have a chance to finish or are we still working? We finished it. Okay, what did you guys come up with? Same thing, 1.47. Okay, all right. And then Aiden, Ethan, and Johnny, were you guys able to finish? Um, yeah, we got uh, 5.9 meters per second squared. Okay. So you got a different value. All right, well, let's, let's walk it through here and see um, how the book suggests to solve it, see if it matches the strategy you used. Uh, if you get the right answer, then 
you'll know hopefully that your strategy works. If you're not sure, you can ask questions and I can confirm whether it will or won't. If you got the wrong answer, then you can figure out you know, where the mistake was made. So what I always do is start with a free body diagram. And so I'm gonna think about what are all the forces going on in this scenario. And generally speaking, the one that's easiest to figure out in terms of forces is obviously anything that's given, but the one that's not usually given that's easy to figure out is the weight force because it's just mass times acceleration due to gravity. Some of you may have used 9.8. Uh, in the textbook, they just typically use 10. Don't forget on the exam next week for positive physics, you do need to use 9.81 for the G value. Uh, so here they've used 10. So they have a weight force of 40 Newtons. And because this is on a flat surface, we know that the normal force would also be 40 Newtons just in the upward direction. So gravity of the earth is pulling it down with 40 Newtons of weight and the structure of the table is lifting it with 40 Newtons of support to keep it from rising or falling. Uh, so we know those two forces, we can figure those out. Pulling force was given obviously. And to find the friction force, you're gonna use the e equation for friction. So the coefficient of friction times the normal force gives you the kinetic friction force. And the kinetic uh, friction coefficient was given 0.36. We figured out from our free body diagram that the normal force is 40 Newtons. So the friction force would be 14 Newtons. So if we add that to our growing list of forces here on our picture, now we know all the forces that this object, this steel bar is experiencing. Weight due to the gravitational force of the earth, support by the table in the terms of normal force, the pulling force of whatever's pulling it, and then the friction because of the contact between the surfaces of the steel and the copper. So when we think about net force, we wanna look at vertical independently and horizontal independently. Vertically speaking, we can see that those forces cancel, so there's no vertical acceleration. Horizontally speaking, they do not cancel, so we should have a horizontal acceleration, which would be the net acceleration since all the vertical forces cancel out. So there's always two ways to find net acceleration. We can take mass, or sorry, net force. We can take mass times acceleration, but um, we're gonna have to figure out what the net force is, or we can add the forces up. So we're gonna have to use that sort of system of equations logic two ways to think through Newton's second law. One, what is the vector sum of the forces to get the net force? And then secondly, mass times acceleration. And because that's two different ways to find the same thing, we can set those equal to each other. So here is redrawn as more of a traditional free body diagram. The 40 Newtons up in normal, the 40 Newtons down in weight, the 20 Newtons to the right by pulling, and the 14 Newtons left due to friction. And so the net force would be like I said, summing up the forces that don't cancel. So the kinetic friction force plus that pulling or applied force. And the net force is also equal to mass times acceleration. So if we plug in the values, since the pulling force and the friction force are in opposite directions, we need to put a sign on them to show that they're in opposite directions. So typically to the right is positive and the left is negative. That's what they've done here. Mass is a scalar, so no sign on that. And so we would have a six Newton net force or a six Newton to the right net force divided by the four kilogram mass. We should get a 1.5 meters per second squared acceleration in the positive direction. So that means it is being accelerated to the right. Um, and in other words, its velocity will be increasing um, in that rightward direction. Now, if you didn't round the normal for, sorry, the uh, friction force to 14, or if you use 9.8 or 9.81 to find your weight and your normal force, you're gonna get slightly different variations. So I think that's why some of you got one, anywhere between 1.4 and 1.5. Um, but this is basically, these are basically the steps you would take to solve this question. Any questions from you about the steps? Is there anything I need to review or what you wanna ask about um, before we move on to other types of problems? So for those that got a different answer, did you figure out what, what the problem was? Yeah, so I, I divided by four at the end, but I forgot to write it down. 
And oh. so I just had the the force at the end, which was the 5.9 newtons. Oh, okay. So you're just one mathematical step short. <laughs> yeah. And I, I looked down at my calculator and it had the correct answer on it. <laughs> I was like, oh, whoops. <laughs> Good. So you're definitely on the right track. For those groups that didn't have a chance to finish, uh, any questions about this, the final steps to get the problem done? Were you on the right track? All right, maybe I got a little hasty there. I was trying to not just keep you in breakout rooms too long, but maybe I cut it a little bit short, so. All right, so that is kind of a review that's similar to what we were doing before um, in our last lesson on Monday, just thinking through the strategy I would always recommend start building a free body diagram. And generally speaking, put down everything you know that's given and then start with the weight force in terms of things you're calculating because weight's always just mg. So that's one that you can know and calculate pretty easily and consistently. And then from there, just keep building out the free body diagram until you get it all figured out. Once you get the free body diagram drawn, then you can see, oh, these cancel, those cancel, these don't. And you can start breaking down your Newton's second law relationship. So we've done angled problems. We've done a plethora of friction problems now. The only thing left really is what if we combine those things? What if we have both angles and friction? How do we work through that? So uh, in this one, it's going to accelerate to the right, as we said. But now let's look at what if that four kilogram object is sitting on some kind of a ramp? And you can see above the box, it says it's zero meters per second. So this box is not moving what's keeping it from moving? Because it's on a slope, it should slide down. Why isn't it? Static friction. Static friction, good. So we're gonna be asked here, calculate the static friction force. And if it's not moving, what can we say about the acceleration? Zero. There's zero no acceleration. acceleration. If we know the acceleration is zero, what does that tell me about the net force? It's also zero. Also zero. No acceleration means no net force. If there's no net force, what's going to end up being true when I build out this free body diagram? It's going to be completely balanced. Yeah, everything's going to, all the vertical is going to cancel, all the horizontal is going to cancel. It's going to be completely balanced. All right. So that's what we want to think about. Sort of, I would always recommend sort of analyze the problem, look for keywords, see if you can you know, kind of think through those steps, think about what's the net force going to be, is, is there going to be a net force, what's the acceleration going to be, is there going to be an acceleration, kind of process all that, then start building out your free body diagram. Now, you can see in the top right hand corner of the screen here, it's they've drawn the angled axes. So instead of the y and the x being traditional, like we usually do in math class, they're saying, let's twist that a little bit, and let's make it match the slope of this ramp. That is not required. But for this problem, it actually will make it easier. If you choose not to do it, you're going to have three different forces that have components. So you're going to have to use trig three different times. If you do angle it, you only have one force that doesn't match the axis. And so you end up only having to do trig once. Uh, I like math, but I would rather do trig once than three times. And so I, I'm going to follow uh, this, this suggestion of angling our axis. Anytime the surface is angled, and there's more than two forces, it's beneficial to angle the axes. All right, so I'm gonna start building out the free body diagram and I'm gonna start with, there's no force given, so I'm gonna start with the weight force because the weight would be the easiest thing to calculate. It's something we know, it's just mg. And so if I think about the weight of this block, it's gonna always go straight down to the center of the earth, irregardless of the shape of the surface. So doesn't matter that this is an angled surface, weight's gonna take it straight down to the center of the earth. And it's M times G I have used, or the textbook here has used 10 meters per second squared. And so we've got four kilogram mass times 10 meters per second squared, 40 Newtons is the weight of this block. But because I've also chosen to take the textbook suggestion and stick with the angled axes pattern, that means this weight force is not on any of those axes. It's between the X and the Y, right? It's not actually on any of those axes. So that makes it an angled force, even though visually it's going straight down. If I'm angling my axis, 
it's not on one, so it's an angled force. Anytime we have an angled force, we want to find its components, all right? So if I want all of my forces or as many as possible to lie on that X and Y sloped axes, uh, I need to figure out the components for this. So if I'm gonna redraw this with components, I need to reference it to my X and Y axis. And my recommendation is always draw a perpendicular leg back to the Y axis on these sloped problems. So the reason we're gonna do that is we wanna find the components, the X and Y components. If I draw this down here on the bottom, if I draw this perpendicular line back to the Y axis, this angle right here between the force and the Y axis is the same as the angle in this ramp. Now we could go through the geometry and, and kind of prove that it is. Um, you can think about the fact that this Y vector, this Y component is perpendicular to the angled surface and the red actual force is perpendicular to the base. Therefore, those angles are equal. That's generally the way I process it. There's a lot of other geometry kind of proof logic you could use to, to prove that these angles are equal. But if you just draw the, the perpendicular back to the y-axis, that angle is going to equal the angle of the ramp. You don't have to. You could draw a perpendicular back to the x-axis. That's fine too. But then your 30 degrees is going to be down here at the bottom. So you just have to be careful. Um, I would stick with one pattern consistently so you're less likely to make an error. Any questions about how we turn this angled weight force into a triangle that aligns with the axes? Okay, any question about how we find the components using sine and cosine? All right, this artificial triangle I've created has the red vector, that 40 Newton weight vector, as the hypotenuse. So if I take the hypotenuse times the sine of 30, it's gonna tell me the value of the component that's opposite the 30 degree angle, which in this case would be along the X axis, the horizontal, the modified horizontal. And if I use the hypotenuse of 40 times the cosine of 30, it's gonna tell me the component adjacent to that angle, which in this case is the vertical component, the Y axis component. So I've got a 20 Newton force in the X direction down the hill, down the ramp. And then I've got a 34.6 Newton force along the Y axis. Can anyone see the advantage to having this Y axis component now? What is that Y component gonna help me figure out? The normal force. Yeah, good, Kayla. Can you expand on that? How, why, why is it helpful? How is it going to help me find the normal force? Um, because if it's balanced, then it will be the same magnitude as the normal force, it's like supporting it upwards. Excellent. Yeah, normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. And by drawing this y-axis along our angled uh, axes here, now it is also perpendicular to the surface. So if this y component, this 34.6 newtons, is perpendicular to the ramp, and the normal force is perpendicular to the ramp. And like we said before, it's sitting still, so there's no acceleration. We know those vertical components have to cancel each other out. So we know now that we have calculated this 34.6 Newton downward Y component. That is the equivalent to the normal force perpendicular and upward to the ramp. So we just continue to kind of build out this free body diagram. We know the acceleration in the y direction is zero. There's no vertical acceleration. So the normal force has to be equal and opposite to that y component of the weight. Questions about that step? So we're missing a force here. What force have we not included yet? The friction force. Yeah, the friction force. What will be the direction of the friction force? The right on the axis. Yeah, it's going to be to the right and parallel to the slope, right along this modified x-axis. Because 
if the gravity would make this try to slide down, right? And there's a there's a gravity component that would make this green box slide down the ramp. If it's not sliding, friction must be directed up the ramp to keep it still. And would it be greater than, less than, or equal to this 20 Newton downwards angled force? I mean, more than, less than, or equal to this 20 Newton X component? Uh, It'll be equal. equal to. And how do we know it's equal, Cade? Because the box isn't moving. Good. No acceleration, so there can be no X acceleration. The acceleration in the X direction is zero, so the static friction force must be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction from that weight X component. So just like we predicted, We've got our four forces now. They all cancel each other out, which doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means there's no acceleration. Since there's no acceleration, this object either stays at rest or continues to move at a constant velocity. Since it was at rest in the problem, it's going to stay at rest. Any questions about pulling together this free body diagram? All right, so we've calculated the friction force. It is 20 Newtons. Let's move on to like a part B sort of question. Um, notice here, we never used the coefficient of friction to solve any of these things. I mean, we know the equation we learned, friction force is equal to coefficient of friction times normal, but we weren't given the coefficient of friction. We don't know what any of these surfaces are so we couldn't look it up. It didn't tell us what these surfaces are made of. So, but recognize we didn't even need to use it, but often they may say, hey, what is it? What is the coefficient of friction? So if we draw this free body diagram, flesh it out, kind of get rid of the ramp, draw all of our forces, we see everything's balanced. The next question they would often ask is, okay, now that you've got this figured out and you know the friction force is 20 Newtons, what's the, calcul what's the uh, coefficient of friction? That's like a part B sort of question. So we have all this information. How am I going to find the coefficient of friction? Um, you have the normal force and the friction force. So you just plug those into the equation to find the friction force. And then the coefficient of friction will be the only variable. So you solve for it. Good. And so you'll divide the friction force by the normal force. Excellent. Yeah, so this equation that we learned, this static friction maximum equals coefficient times normal force. We know the friction force is 20. We know the normal force is 34.6. So even though we don't know what these materials are, so we can't really look up the coefficient, we can calculate it. This is how you do it experimentally. You actually measure all of these different forces or determine what they are, and then you can use them to figure out what the coefficient should be. And like we said, we know the 20 and the 34.6. Like Ethan mentioned, we're just going to divide. Notice that the units cancel because we've got Newtons divided by Newtons. So it's a unitless number. And it's 0.577 um, for the coefficient of static friction between these two surfaces. So if we weren't sure what these surfaces were, maybe we think, oh, I think it might be steel and copper, or I think it might be iron and you know whatever. We could look it up and see if the coefficient matches what we think these surfaces are made of. Questions about this problem? We've, we've basically done two things, found the friction force, and then in addition, found the coefficient of friction. Very typical kinds of questions you would be asked. All right, um, the next kind of a question is the same basic thing. We're gonna go through this problem again, but in a, a different approach. And this is less about the exam you're taking next week and more about me helping you prepare for the exam you'll be taking in May. Uh, the positive physics doesn't really give you a lot of, hey, solve this with just variables and no numbers. It's pretty much number driven so that it can give you quick feedback. But the College Board exam next May 
frequently asks you questions without numbers. And we need to continue to practice working through problems that way, because I would be shocked if you don't have at least two of the five free response questions that require you to do that. Um, off, there was one year where there wasn't a single free response question that had numbers. Every one that had you'd find out an equation all was based on variables. So you need to get practice with that. So even though it's not necessarily for next week, we need to practice this skill consistently throughout the class. So we are going to symbolically determine the coefficient of friction using just variables and no numbers. And I'm doing it right after because you've just seen the process. We're gonna go through the same step. So I'll go through it fairly quickly. I'll go through it hopefully slow enough you can jot some things down if you wanna follow along. Um, but I want you to see and, and be start thinking through how do we do this with when there's no numbers? So if they just said, hey, find the coefficient of friction symbolically with M is the mass and theta is the angle and it's sitting still, the velocity is zero. So it's the same scenario, but just no numbers. Well, I need to start the same way. I'm gonna think through building out my free body diagram and I usually start with weight because that's an easy thing to calculate, but I don't have numbers. So I'm not gonna give it a number. I'm just gonna say, well, the weight is mg. And from now on, anytime I refer to the weight, I'm just gonna to refer to it as mg. Because the question on the, on the exam might say something like, find the coefficient of friction in terms of mass, the acceleration due to gravity and the angle or something like that. And so they, they want you to use certain variables in your final result, or at least show that you've considered those variables in your work. Well, because this is on a slope, it's generally advisable to angle your axes, which means we would need to find components for this. If we're gonna find the X and Y components for this so that it matches an angled axis, then the Y component would be mg, which is the value for the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta. And the X component would be mg, which is the value for the hypotenuse times the sine of theta. So it's the same work we did. We're just not actually plugging in numbers. We're keeping it in formula form, okay? Equation form. And so now we have redrawn those two components, but just in equation form. And so we can eliminate the angled force from our mathematical consideration. And we can realize, okay, well, same as before, that Y component's now perpendicular to the surface. It's still sitting still on the slope. So it's going to be the same as the normal force. There's still no vertical acceleration. So the normal force is going to be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the Y component. So while the normal force would be positive in reference to the weight being negative, the magnitude for both is mg cosine theta. And because the block is just sitting there on the ramp, then its maximum friction force um, would be equal to that downward force. So if the downward component is mg sine of theta and it's sitting still, then the maximum static friction force would be mg sine of theta as well. Their signs would be opposite because of direction, but their magnitudes would be equal. So we're just processing through without any numbers, just using equations. And then we do the last step the same as well. We've got all of our forces. We figured them all out based on what we know in terms of variables, m, g, and the theta. And we're still gonna think through our equation for friction. So that static friction maximum is gonna be coefficient times normal. So we know the maximum static friction is mg sine of theta. We know the normal force is mg cosine of theta. So if we solve for coefficient of friction, if we solve for mu s, we get mg sine of theta divided by mg cosine of theta and the M and the G cancel out. So we end up just getting sine of theta over cosine of theta. And if you stop there, that is an acceptable answer. However, if you know enough trig, there is one further step of simplification we could do. Anybody know it? Sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. That's just tangent of theta, right? Yeah. So if you simplified it to tangent of theta, you would also receive full credit. 
So College Board kind of allows both because they know students are at different levels of their understanding in TRIG. Some students are taking TRIG concurrently uh, with this course um, because they've designed it to be eligible all the way down to the freshman level. Um, they give you either tangent theta or sine theta over cosine theta would be as acceptable results. So to find the coefficient of static friction for an object just sitting there on the slope, does it even matter what the mass is? Not if it's sitting still. Now, if we were using numbers, or if it wasn't sitting still, if it was accelerating, then we couldn't just use this. But if it's just sitting still, there's actually a shortcut. Now, this is an equation that we've derived it now. Static friction coefficient is equal to the tangent of the angle. I would encourage you put that on your list of equations. I remember earlier in the year I said, hey, we're going to come up with some equations at different times that aren't really part of your AP list, but can help you solve problems. This is one I would add to that list. Uh, it's not on the formula sheet they provide, but I would just encourage you on that half side of the paper that's half empty, be writing down equations that we learned that aren't given. This is one I would say it can be helpful. Now, if they said symbolically determine the equation, you would have to show the work to earn full credit. But if they just gave you a problem with numbers and you remembered, oh, the coefficient of friction is just the tangent of the angle, uh, if the object's sitting still, uh, then you could actually use this shortcut to quick uh, to make the so problem solving step quicker. So probably won't be super helpful, but if you tuck it in there and have it as a resource that you never know, there might be a question where, oh, that's going to make it quicker. <laughs> All right, any questions about that problem, solving it symbolically? Um, I have a question about the final thing we derive, the mm -hmm. can't hear the coefficient of friction. Um, so if you angled it more, the coefficient would change because, so that coefficient isn't for the maximum, it's just for the angle, I guess, the force that would be applied at that angle. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Because you could increase the angle and then the um, coefficient would also increase with mm -hmm. the force that it's, okay. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Any other questions? All right, let's look at a different scenario now, still with a ramp, but this time you can see it says determine the coefficient of friction if the object is moving, so it's kinetic friction. And you can see here a keyword constant velocity term, constant velocity. So what is that key term, constant velocity? It should signal something in your brain right away. If it isn't yet, hopefully it will be soon. What is that phrase, constant velocity, there's tell no me? No acceleration. No acceleration. If there's no acceleration, what does that tell me? That all the forces are balanced. There's no net force. All the forces balance. Okay. So this is going to be pretty similar to the problem we just solved, even though it's moving, because it's moving at a constant velocity. We'll finish the day working out a problem where it's not at a constant velocity. But when it is, it's basically the same premise that we just went through, even though it is moving. We just need to build up our free body diagram. And remember that since it's at a constant velocity, all the forces we come up with have to balance. So we've got this four kilogram block. Because it's moving at a constant velocity, all the forces will balance. We start building out our free body diagram. Generally speaking, it's easiest to start with the weight because that's always m times g. In this case, we know the m. It's four kilograms, so we've got a 40 newton weight. And we know that if we are looking at a, an object on a slope, mathematically, it's going to simplify things if we angle our axes to match that slope. Since this one would not be on an axis with that angled approach, we need to find the components. And so just like before, when we find the components, we'll draw a perpendicular, preferably, no, maybe not preferably, but I, I prefer to draw it back to the Y axis so that I can easily see where that 30 degree angle would line up. But you could draw it back to the horizontal axis as well and still solve it. 
And then I'm going to use that hypotenuse times the sine of 30 to find the horizontal or x component. And I'm going to find I'm going to use the hypotenuse of 40 times the cosine of 30 to find that vertical or y component. And just like before, while these aren't actual forces, these are just mathematical impacts of the actual 40 newtons of weight downward. So some, you know, half of the weight is basically trying to get it to slide down the hill. And an, another 34.6 newtons of force is trying to keep it in contact with the hill. And so just like before, since it's not accelerating, it's going at a constant velocity. And even if it was accelerating along the slope, it wouldn't be accelerating vertically. So vertically speaking, we know the normal force being perpendicular to the surface will match the y component of the weight, which is also perpendicular to the surface. So even if it was accelerating, that would still be true because we wouldn't expect it to fly up into the air or anything. So, however, because it's going at a constant velocity, we know that again, the friction force is going to be equal and opposite to that x component down the slope. So this ends up being just like what we did before, no difference in anything, even though it's still, even though in this case it is sliding, but the key is, it's sliding at a constant velocity. So once we've drawn out the forces, we could make our dot and make it a true traditional free body diagram if we wanted to. Uh, but we can see the friction force. We can see the normal force. We can plug those into the equation. And we can come up with our coefficient of kinetic friction. So if this is the same ramp and the same block as before, this is one of those strange surface combinations where the coefficient of kinetic friction and the coefficient of static friction are equal. It could be though that they just change the substances from one problem to the next and it's just coincidental that the kinetic friction for these substances, the coefficient is the same as the static for the other substances. That's possible as well. They haven't given us enough information to really know that. Questions about this scenario? All right. I would recommend that you try what the next slide is going to show you. Again, just a reminder, there's no units here because the Newtons cancel. So our coefficient is unitless. This one, they ask you to go through the same process we did a minute ago. See if you can figure out the coefficient of kinetic friction symbolically. And it's gonna be very similar to what you did before, but it's good practice. So I would encourage you, hey, if you've got the time, think it through. Could you figure out the coefficient of friction if it's kinetic, if it's sliding using that same process? I'm not gonna walk you through it because it's so similar to what we did. And it's not really something to focus on for this semester, more for next semester but I think it's a good one for you to maybe try. So I'll just kind of fast forward through it, um, but hopefully you can give it a shot. What I do want to quickly review as we wrap up unit five is what free body diagrams look like without the components, just the actual bare free body diagrams for various scenarios. So if we have a block sliding down a ramp with no friction, this is what it looks like. The normal force is perpendicular to the ramp. The weight force is straight down and there is no other force if there's no friction. The object is being slid down the hill because of the X component of the weight. There's not a force other than that pulling on it to make it slide down the ramp. It's just those two forces. If there is friction, we might have a block sitting stationary on the ramp. That means the friction is static friction and there would get, again be no fourth force. We could break the weight force into components, but there are just three forces, the normal that's perpendicular to the ramp, the static friction force that's parallel to the ramp, and the weight force, which is directly down. If the block was stationary, but just about to slip, the only thing that would be different is that that stationary, or sorry, that static friction force would be the max. It's just at that verge where it's about to slip, and that would be the maximum static friction force. But in terms of the shape of the free body diagram, it's still the same three forces oriented in the same angles. And then the last one, what if it's sliding down the ramp at a constant velocity? Even actually, if it's not sliding down the ramp at a constant velocity, it's still just these same three forces. 
The only thing that would be different between if it's at a constant velocity or if it's accelerating would be how long that FK force vector is. If it's at a constant velocity, that FK arrow needs to be the same length as the X component of the weight. If it's accelerating down the slope, then the FK, FK arrow, the kinetic friction force arrow should be shorter than the X component of the weight. But in terms of what forces are there and how, what their angles would be, the shape of it, generally speaking, is the same. And then just a few last things about drawing free body diagrams. When you draw them, only draw the forces that are exerted on the object. Don't draw anything that's internal. Don't draw any of the, so the internal forces would be like those Newton's third law force pairs. Um, so you don't wanna draw those other sides of the force pairs. You just wanna focus on what are the forces acting on this object, not any forces that this object is exerting on other things, okay? It's always from the perspective of the object, what forces are acting on the object. That's the, what you draw. The black dot is the center of gravity for whatever object we're referring to. And we're gonna learn more about that phrase center of gravity next semester, right after Christmas break actually. So we'll focus on that then. Uh, when you draw your forces, they should be straight, not curved lines. They can be at angles, but they should be straight, not curvy. And they should all originate from that dot. You should label all of them, preferably somewhere near the arrowhead. So it's easy to see which one you're labeling. And with something that makes sense, there's, it doesn't have to be exactly the same letters as another person, but they should be labeled clearly. If you're using non-standard uh, labels or variables, then you probably want to make a little key to explain it. Never draw the components of forces in free body diagrams. So even though there are components to this weight force, don't draw them on your free body diagram. You could replace the weight force with them later as you're solving the problem. But if the exam says draw the free body diagram, you don't include the forces on it, the components on it. Uh, and then never draw velocity or acceleration vectors on the diagram. You could draw it to the side if that helps you process, but you wouldn't draw them as part of the diagram, not connected to the dot in any way. So those are some quick reminders. And all of this is in your textbook as well. This is the section of notes from your textbook. And again, I think I've mentioned this before. I can't post these PowerPoints on Access because they're copyright protected for that. Um, but you can see the same information in your textbook if you're going through chapters four and five. And that is all I have for you from chapter five. There's one other question I wanna have you work on, one other scenario that I think you could be tested on. Um, but I do wanna say in the textbook, they also do go through at the end of chapter five and talk about drag force. And they introduce this equation that drag force is equal to C times V squared, where C is a particular constant. Um, that is not something that College Board tests you over. It's sort of an extra content that the textbook has included. It's not a bad thing to review in terms of thinking through forces and thinking through free body diagrams, but that equation is not something that College Board expects you to know. And it's also not something they provide on the list. So if you're, if you're trying to save time preparing for the exam, because I know you've got a lot of other exams potentially to prepare for, uh, I would not focus too much on this whole drag part at the end of chapter five. It's interesting. It is good practice to think through various force problems, but you never need to know this drag equation for AP1. So just a kind of a note there that that's not something to, to worry about. All right. The last thing I want to go over is one other kind of problem that you would frequently see on an exam, or at least potentially. We've looked at angles, we've looked at um, static friction, kinetic friction at a constant velocity, but we need to practice one that is kinetic friction where it's not at a constant velocity, where it is accelerating. And so um, I'm going to have you try one more problem together as we wrap things up here. Um, I'll, I'll come around to the groups and make sure you're close to done before I cut the time off this time. Uh, that way, if you need just a little bit more time, I'll know. So I won't just time it. I'll actually visit the groups. But here, you could take a screenshot of this if you want, or you can jot down some information. We have a 50 kilogram crate being pushed across a level floor. So it's a flat floor. It's being pushed with 100 newtons of applied force. 
And that force is enough to not just get it to move, but actually cause it to accelerate at one meter per second squared. So it's not balanced this time. It does have an acceleration. And the question is, what is the coefficient of friction? So that whole shortcut tangent thing doesn't work, one, because it's not on an angle. And then two, there's an acceleration. So that whole sh tangent shortcut is a very limited thing. It can only help you when it's on an angle and when it's at constant velocity. But this one doesn't have either of those conditions. So I'll just give you a few more seconds to make sure you have what you need. And then we'll put you in breakout rooms. Anybody need more time to get these numbers written down? All right, off you go, good luck. I'll check in after a few minutes and see how you're doing. minus fr the friction force equals 50 oh. times one mm -hmm. I think okay. and then and then that would be 50 equals the friction force yeah. did I do that right all right I think we've got everybody back in the room now. And as I wandered around through the groups, I think everybody got the right answer in the end. I'm just gonna very quickly just run through my setup and solution to the problem so you can compare and see if you have any questions and that'll be it for today. So if we start this kind of a problem, I always want to figure out my free body diagram. And so I know there's a weight force going down and because it's on a level floor, I know the normal force would be straight up from that and those would have to be equal and opposite. So I put my little congruency markers on there. I can find the weight force pretty easily. It's just mass times acceleration due to gravity. I used 10. So I took 50 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared to find that the weight is 500 newtons. I also know that the weight is equal to the normal force, which is equal to mg. So if the weight is 500 newtons, the normal force also has to be 500 newtons. And then the applied force was given 100 newtons. So I've thought through what weight and normal force are here. I've drawn my free body diagram here with all of its labeled values and variables. 
The next thing that I do is try to figure out, well, how can I find some relationship that includes that friction force? So I just went to two things. I thought, well, friction force is equal to the kinetic friction, coefficient of kinetic friction times normal force. And I know net force can be found by taking the applied force minus friction, because that would be the vector sum of these two horizontal forces. And I also know net force can be found by taking mass times acceleration. So I've got my Newton's second law relationship here. I know the applied force, I know the mass, I'm looking for the acceleration. So that's a missing variable. And I don't know the value for the friction force, but I do know the friction force is equal to the coefficient times the normal. So if I put, or sorry, sorry, I do know the acceleration is one. I'm looking for the coefficient. Uh, so since I'm knowing that the friction force is mu times Fn, I substitute that in. And now I know the applied force is 100. I know the normal force is 500. I know the mass is 50 and the acceleration is one. I've got everything but this coefficient. So a little bit of substitution there. Then I just plug in the numbers, 100 Newtons for applied, 500 for normal, 50 kilograms for the mass, one meter per second squared for the acceleration. And I solve for mu K, the coefficient of friction for kinetic friction. And I got 0.1 um, with, with the actual sig figs, uh, since all these numbers given only had one, I just left it with one. Um, if you were on the positive physics website, they would want you to have three sig figs or more. So I think most of you were writing things like 0 0.102 or 0 0.10, something like that, depending on when and how you rounded and whether you use 10 or 9.8. So any questions about this one? All right, we've done all the variety of kinds of problems you could do in terms of angled forces, friction forces, tension forces, Atwood's machines. Um, now, obviously, they could come up with an infinite number of scenarios, uh, but in terms of the way you think them through, we've really approached every strategy you need to be familiar with. So the, the work now is just practice, practice, practice. Do as much review as you can, practicing as many kinds of problems as you can. Um, you know exactly what to expect for the exam next week. And if you prepare well through the Positive Physics website, and then even add on some review on the AP Classroom website, you should be quite well prepared for this exam next Tuesday. Um, if you have questions for me, uh, we've got about 15 minutes here left. If you have questions, feel free to stick around and ask those questions. Uh, but if you don't have any questions, you can be dismissed and I'll look forward to seeing you next Tuesday for our exam. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.